All their affliction was afflicted. Isaiah 63 tells us. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. He was touched with the feelings of their infirmities. And as he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, as we go through it, he goes through it. And even more so because he's not guilty. He was tempted at all points like as we are, yet without sin. We know Jeremiah was not sinless, but Jeremiah sinned less. Amen. Jeremiah was God's man and tried to live all out for God. He was not the one that was going against, going after idolatry. He was living for Jesus. He was living for God, Jehovah God. He was looking away unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And yet he went through it all. His prophet, he looked under her destruction, or her destruction, and he wept. In verse number, uh, chapter 3, in uh, verse number 48 and 49, we can see this. Mine eye running down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Mine eye trickling down and ceases not without any intermission. That's Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 9, he says, Oh, that my head were watered and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. He is known as the weeping prophet. Yep. And do you not know that you can, have you not considered Christ when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it? I wonder what he's doing today as he looks down at the churches. Some of them just show the shit. Some of them just saying, oh, it does not matter that this man is with his father's wife. We're going to embrace them anyway. That's what they did in Corinth. And some of them saying, we'll not let sin nowhere near us. We won't even talk to sin. And he said, either side of that is bad, if not mourned. If not mourned. We ought to be weeping prophets. We ought to weep with them that weep. And the world is living in wickedness, but they find themselves at night in their rooms by themselves. And they find themselves, I wish I'd get victory over this stuff. How come I can't stop it? I want to stop doing this. I don't like where it's leading me. You say that and never, that's not the way they are. You do not know where sin brings people in. Just go ask any drunkard who loses his family from drunkardness. Go ask any doper who loses his family because of his dope. Go ask any gambler who just sat there and lost their paycheck down there at this whatever that place is. Horseshoe. The horseshoe. They think they're lucky. That horseshoe, that's what the Colts have for their symbol too. They think they're lucky. The only luck the Colts ever had was Andrew. Amen. That's a different answer. Come on. I'm just trying to tell you this. They go to the horseshoe to see nothing and lose everything. You don't think they're in their room that night saying, How do I do this? Why? Sitting in their prison cells tonight saying, Why did I do that? Why did I go with my friends to that excess of riot that we went to? Why did I do this and get that I lost my friends, I lost my family, I'm over here by my lonesome? Do not tell me that the world does not sorrow mm. over their sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. When their sin catches up with them, they find themselves weeping, brokenness. And what are we doing? We're rejoicing because they got what they deserve? Who's more wicked? Christ is not rejoicing over them getting what they deserve. No, sir. Oh, uh, 
He wept over the sea. Jeremiah wept over the sea. They didn't say we're just going to whoop them and win an election. Why are we not weeping over America? I'm preaching about America. I'm trying to tell you the problem is we've not wept. Amen. He looked at the destruction and wept. It is pictorial of Christ. It's personal. Jeremiah was going through all these things as guilty, though he's not. A loathing situation. Not only do I find the brokenness and mourning and his weeping, but I find that his prayer was not answered. He shut it out my prayer, is what he says in chapter 3 and verse number. I can't even pray for it. I cry in the daytime but thou hearest not in the night season and am not silent. Is how it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ in Psalm 22, that prophetic song. He kept praying, he kept praying. I'd ask you this, do you agonize in prayer for a wayward nation, for a wayward of Christianity? Do we weep? Do we agonize in prayer? Just because we don't go to the same excess of right as they go to does not mean we're doing right. If we have not come to the place where we see and we sorrow over our nation and we sorrow over the condition of the churches across America, Christianity around the world, if we do not sorrow over it, Something's wrong, not just with them, but something's wrong with me. And something's wrong with you. I find Jeremiah is wits in as he sees the languishing nation, as he feels this local situation. But can I tell you, I love chapter 3. Because that's where God remembered His word unto His servant upon which He has caused us to hope. Do you not see it down here as we find here as we start reading? This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. Hmm. Verse 21. Because there's a lovely revelation that God gives right in the midst of this loathsome situation. As he's looking at this languishing nation, he says, God says, I'm going to let you see some things. I'm going to recall some things to your mind. I'm going to remember the word of the servant upon which you can hope in. I'm telling you, God did something for Jeremiah that did something for Jeremiah. Oh, hallelujah. I'll do something for you and me. Oh, the loathsome situation. Verses 17 through 20. He says, And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, My strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remember my affliction, my misery, my worm, the wormwood of God. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. The loathsome situation. Oh, but the lovely revelation starts in verse 21. And he's held. He's held. This I recall in my mind, therefore have I hope. He saw some things. He saw the pity. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness, that God has pity on his people. Even in judgment, he has mercy. His mercy endures forever. Even when it's going rough, even when it's going tough, even when it's for our own sin, God has mercy. He will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I told you that, that oh yes, He'll never leave you nor forsake you with His judgment. When He comes, He will leave His judgment alone. Sometimes it's going on forever. Hmm. But even when he's there and chasing, he's also there to comfort. That's true. But they didn't want his comfort because they refused to repent. Mm -hmm. 
But when it came to the end of it, God's mercy was still there. Mm -hmm. His mercies are new every morning. Oh, when you wake up in the morning, you say, I had a hard time last night because I'm sitting there sorrowful for my sin and I can't sleep at night because I weep at night. And then God says, I'm still here. Oh, I'm still here. He has pity on his people. Oh, Jeremiah saw the pity and that made him hope. The Lord's compassion fail not. Oh, even in his chastening there is compassion. He will not cast us away utterly. For we are his sheep. We are his people. The sheep of his pasture. Oh, Jeremiah got happy. Oh, why? Because he got hope filled. And I tell you what, it may have been a sad situation and he may have been singing in a minor key, but can I say something was going on and he started singing. <coughs> oh, he said it's of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed. His compassion. Things. But he did not just see the pity. He saw the portion. The portion in verse number 21 or 24, we will find the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Oh, hey, listen. Even when I'm going through it, the Lord is my portion. Uh, my portion is not the portion of this. Uh, so I might be going through a loathsome situation, but can I say, uh, the Lord is my Savior. The Lord is my sovereign. That's my hope. He's here with me. He's not going away from me. I always have Him. I can rest in the promises of God. I'm telling you, He got some hope. He got some help. You say, why? Because the Lord is his portion. Mm -hmm. Oh, just wait. Just wait. Verses 25 and 26 tell us, The Lord is good to them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And Jeremiah said, guess what? Hey, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting because I know that God's going to pull us through this thing. This is not the end. The Lord is my portion. I know that I've got a home in heaven where the saints abide just over the glory land. I mean, a reserve in heaven for me. Oh, it's undefiled and faded not away. And it's there for me. Can I say even when I'm going through the hard times because of my sin and in my sorrows and I feel, feel the severity of the chastening of God, I know it's not over. I have a hope because I have Home. Thank God Jeremiah said this ain't the end of it. The Lord is my portion. Not only do I see that. But let me say, he said, just wait. He said, just work on. Just work on. Keep going. Just keep pressing on. He tells us that, verse 27, it's good for a man to be buried and joke in his youth. Just keep working. Just keep on going on for God. Keep waiting on God. Keep working for God. You'll get through this thing on the other side. He said, you don't know how bad it is. Can I say, Jeremiah wasn't guilty. He was going through it. And he said, I don't like this. But he wasn't looking at himself. He was looking at the whole nation. He was weeping over the whole nation. He was. He wasn't feeling sorry for himself. He was feeling sorry for the situation and for society. And he was in the midst of Christ who went through all that Christ went through, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He had to go through the sorrowful, the loathsome situation, the sorrowful situation. He had to go through all of that. As he was made to be sin for us, even though he knew no sin. But he knew. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Oh, let me say, the Lord is his portion. When the Lord is our portion, we know that there's a home prepared where the saints abide. And uh, he has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. I'm prepared for that. He's preparing me for that. He is conforming me to the image of Christ. He's making me what I am. 
Hallelujah. He's making me meet to be partaker of what I'm a partaker of. He's promised it. They're all, the, the angels are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. Let me say this. He saw God's pity. He saw him, his portion. He, he saw God's purpose. He brings you down so that he can bring you up. Because mm -hmm. no sin will enter in. No liar will have their part in heaven. They'll all have their part in the fire. He has no choice but to conform us to Christ. If we're going to forever live with Christ. I had a man the other day, and I'm done. Said, we were talking about some things, and he said, uh, talking about a rock and roll musician by the name of Eddie Van Halen who died a while back. And he said, this man says, well, he's in heaven now. And I said, I don't think so. First of all, he wouldn't want to be there. Christians are there. And there's nothing godly about the way man lived his life. I said, maybe he got saved near the end. I don't know. But as far as I can tell, that man's not in heaven. Why? Because there's no evidence of him ever being conformed to the cross. This shallow salvation of I got saved, so I'm going to heaven. Well, if God saved your soul, He's going to change your life. Yep. If God saved you, He will sanctify you. He will make you conform to the image of Christ. And we know that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I will say this, and I've said it so many times. I am not saying a person get saved and that they're going to become perfect. But you will, if they're saved for a long period of time, especially as they see, get a chance to understand things and they have no desire to get rid of sin out of their life, there is no evidence of salvation, do not treat them like they're saved. Do not treat them like they're saved. They may be back, they may have gone away backwards, I don't know. But do not take somebody at their word if they have no works. We know that for by grace are you saved by faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God. Not of works that any man should boast. But we do not end in that statement with that statement that there. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus <coughs> under good works which God has ordained and we should walk through. I say this. My friend, oh, there was not just a language of nation. There was not just a loathing situation. But if we look beyond all that, oh, we will find a lovely revelation. It is of the Lord's mercy that we're not consumed. The only reason He brings sorrow is so that he can bring sweetness. It was not the will of the Father to heap sin upon the Son of God. It was the will of the Father to save sinners. And the only way that he could save sinners is that God become man. And then take our sin upon his own sake. So God went against his own will to accomplish his will. Because God does not breathe man just for the faith's sake of it. I want to make man hurt. I want to make man feel bad. 
He does it for a purpose. That man might come to the end of himself and look away unto the Savior. Look away unto the sweet Savior and say, Dear God, I need thee. Oh, I need thee. I need thee for my salvation from the penalty of sin. I need thee for the salvation from the power of sin in one day, dear God. I need thee so I'm separated from the presence of sin. My friend, I do not know what your need is. But can I tell you whether you're going through a sorrowful situation, loathful situation, look away on Jesus. He will give you a lovely revelation that it doesn't always have to be like this. There's something better on the other side. Oh, God has a purpose in all that He does. And that purpose is salvation. 